Thank you, Mr. Chair. As a result of the information that we gleaned from the Standards uh, Commission, and also from a survey that was uh, launched by the Department of Public Instruction, we asked every math teacher in high school to give us feedback, standard by standard, on, the, um, on their view of what in the math standards at high school needs to be changed. We have heard from the Standards Commission that high school math seemed to be the area where we needed the most attention. The teachers uh, in the field agreed that the standards in high school um, needed clarification and needed to be um, divided differently among the four courses in high school. So as we speak, we do have writing teams who are beginning to rewrite the high school math standards. We have done an early uh, comparison in Math 1, which is our foundational course and which also informs the school performance grades as part of our state accountability system. If the changes in the core Math 1 course we feel are going to be under 20%, which would trigger a new end of course assessment in Math 1. So because that is the foundational course, then it appears that those standards will not be impacted as heavily as the upper courses in high school. However, Math 2, and Math 3 will see significant change. And as a result, uh, we feel that for the 15-16 school year, when we feel that these standards can be, I mean, I'm sorry, the 16-17 year, which we feel that these standards can be implemented, that Math 2 and Math 3 we will suspend the final exam. And instead of having a final exam required, we will have statewide field testing of those items in 1617 so that we can get good feedback from the students across the state and how well those items uh, perform and then we would go operational with that assessment in 1718 so that means that next year since those two courses would have field tests we could do the professional development at the same time that we're implementing the standards because it would not be a high stakes assessment at the end and therefore we would feel that we could go ahead with implementation the high school teachers would like to see those standards changed and so we feel like by suspending the assessment that we can move ahead with high school mathematics as early as next year. Now, uh, K-8 math, we will start those revisions in October. Any significant change to K-8 math, especially in grades 3 through 8, would indeed have an impact on the end of grade assessment. And the end of grade is certainly used for school performance grades. In fact, it is the school performance grades for grades three through eight because there are no other indicators. So if there are significant changes, then we would have to do a different rollout for those courses because those tests would have to be operational at when we went live with that test, which means we would have to take a year to do professional development. We would have to field test items ahead of time then we would have to implement when those assessments are ready because of federal accountability as well as state accountability. English language arts, we are starting this summer bringing in the data review teams to look at the Standards Commission uh, report. They also have been surveyed across the state and we'll be looking at the feedback standard by standard. So we'll be looking at the feedback from the teachers to determine how much needs to change in English language arts. So we're moving ahead very quickly high school mathematics and the other revisions are following closely behind. Representative Porn. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Young, would you please go back and, and review again with us who's participating in this review process and rec review and recommendation process? You talked about teachers' participation. <coughs> Flesh that out a little bit more for me. Be happy to. In fact, I'm glad you asked. So we have teachers who are involved. We have university representation um, across the state. Um, I have seen a video that we put together for our state board um, that highlights some of the folks who were there. So we had professors from Appalachian, for example. Uh, there were professors from NC State. So we're, we're seeing folks from across um, the state. We had Business and industry participated in the review. 
So we've had school administrators, we've had university involvement, we've had um, a wide variety of involvement. And, and the period of time, that, over what period of time is this? This has been going on, we pretty much started doing this survey um, at the beginning of this past school year. And so we wanted a standard by standard um, input from the teachers. Instead of just asking generally what is it about the standards that you don't like, give us your feedback on the standard and tell us how you think it ought to be different. So we wanted more than sort of lip service feedback, we wanted very specific feedback from the teachers. So we have been doing the survey pretty much at the same time the Standards Review Commission was meeting so that once it became time to make decisions, we have all the information at one time. One last. If I may, Mr. Chairman, one last, I don't know if it's a comment or a question, but in the Academic Standards Review Commission, when we created that and asked them, we charged them with ensuring that our standards were among the highest in the nation. And it's really, I think it's important to all of us that that message is crystal clear to everyone participating in, in the review and, and creation of North Carolina standards. So I just can't help myself, but I just want to make sure that that's, that that is a critical piece of all this. So that as we compare how we're doing with, with other states, even though we may not be using the same, necessarily the same measuring stick, but generally speaking, our rigor and excellence have to be the guiding, uh, the guiding uh, guideposts of this along this path. The gold standard for us, uh, if, I don't know the statutory reference, but somewhere in statute, there is a reference that we are to get as closely aligned to NAEP as we can the National Assessment right. of Educational Progress. So we always look at our NAEP scores not only to determine if our standards have rigor, but to see how our students are performing with other students across the country. So we will continue to use NAEP as that benchmark that we try to make sure that we aspire to. Thank you very much, John. Are the other questions from committee? Uh, Representative Johnson. I did, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I did meet with some of the people that, some of the teachers that, when they served on your commission, they were well pleased with all that. Um, I want to make sure I understand the timeline. You're saying that we as the legislature will be able to know, and the people will be able to know in the year 1718. Is that correct? Actually, for high school mathematics. Now, I should, I should acknowledge, all of this is pending. You're hearing this before the state board actually gets this official um, notification and recommendation. So this is all going to the state board in April. And if they, um, we have had to start ahead of time if we were going to have any changes for next year. And so if the state board approves the writing of the standards and then they will um, pass and adopt the standards early this summer, which we hope they will, then we will be implementing new standards at high school next school year, 1617. So high school math standards are slated to change immediately. The teachers felt it was an immediate need. So we're trying to meet their requests because they're the folks who have to be able to implement this. And they understand best, in our mind, how high school math should be organized. And so we see an immediate change in high school math standards. We are able to do that because in high school there really is only one assessment that affects accountability, and that's math one. It affects state and federal accountability, and we feel that course will have the least impact because it's the foundational course, and the foundational standards for the most part do not change. But it's how you build on those foundational standards in math two and math three that the teachers feel like need the most attention. We use a final exam, which is a state requirement. We use that to determine student growth. And so if we suspend <clears throat> the math two and math three assessment for one year, the only impact would be that for one year, teachers would not know student growth, but we would have student growth for the several years before. So typically teachers and their student growth remains pretty constant. So that would be the only impact so we would be able to suspend those final exams for one year, which would not have a great impact at the local level, and do field testing instead to make sure that the items are behaving the way they should. 
and then we could go operational with that test the next year. At grades three through eight, because there is a huge impact on federal and state accountability, then it will probably take an additional year because we have to get the standards written, approved by the board, we have to bring the writing teams in. Once we have standards, then we have to do professional development for the teachers. And depending on how much the standards are impacted, if there's more than a 20 to 25 percent change, we would have to have new assessments. So then we have to build those assessments and build SE items. So that is a longer process to be able to change grades through the way. But for high school, because there's only one course impacted by accountability, then we're able to move faster. Keep rolling, Representative Thompson. I just want to make sure I understand, and, and I, I no, know a lot of people have the same uh, question. I was concerned because all the standards, all the way to uh, K-12, K and the new federal <coughs> requirements that came out, that we were going to be able to do all of that in sequence and be out in the correct time. And you're saying that that would be ready 17, 18. That's our, our hope is that it would be ready in 1718. <clears throat> that we would be able to do next year standards revision, adopt standards, do professional development, and hopefully embed enough field test items in next year's end of grade that then we could change the assessments for the following year and implement the following year. Representative Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Garland. Um, you know, I used to think that lawyers uh, had a lot of jargon to keep up with, but I, I realized that the educational field is pretty uh, pretty close. Um, you use the term assessments and indicators. Those be tests. Assessments are tests. Yes. Okay. All right. Are these tests going to be able to determine growth and performance? They do. We are able to do proficiencies based on cut scores. So to sort of abbreviate the process. You know, you know cut score, right? I assume it's... Right. It's the number you have to get correct yeah. to pass the test. So we have to be able to set cut scores. We typically do it, and I know that this raises some suspicion, but we usually do cut scores after the fact. And the reason we, do, we bring in standards review and we bring in teachers and there's a process. It's a psychometric process that is industry standard when we do cut scores. What we have found is that when we do field tests, sometimes because students know their field tests, so when you do a field test, sometimes students don't perform the same on a field test that they do on a true operational test. So we go back and do cut scores once we know students have done their absolute best because it is an operational test. So if we have new tests, we have to set cut scores, which means that can, that's a process that you have to go through. Um, for student growth, what we are able to do, they're two truly separate indicators. Student growth, we work with SAS. It is an EBOS. SAS actually provides for us our student growth data. The way that EBOS works, SAS is able through these huge supercomputers that they have, and I am not a statistician, but they're able to enter every test score a student has ever had, regardless of what the content is and the computer can actually project how much each individual student is supposed to grow. And so, to simplify it, if I'm a teacher and my students fall within a standard deviation of where they're supposed to grow, I have net growth. If a significant enough number of my students have exceeded the amount that they were supposed to grow, then I exceeded growth. And if a, if a significant enough amount of my students did not meet growth, then I did not meet growth. So it's based on a projection of growth, which has nothing to do, so it's on a scale. So that has nothing to do with proficiency. So I can be a teacher who is teaching special education students and none of my students reach proficiency, but they all have grown more than they're supposed to have grown based on past performance. So I could exceed growth, even though my students do not all meet proficiency because they were so far behind when I got them. So they truly are two different measures. Back to Representative Horn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Dr. Brown. I'm curious as to you, you mentioned that participating in the in the standards review process for universities. And 
in our universities here in North Carolina provide, I believe, about 80% of our teachers that we have in North Carolina. Maybe that's a little high. Real high. Real high. Real Well, uh, yeah. Fewer than half. Or right about. The universities and the privates and independents <coughs> are about 40 to 50 percent. Then we have, out of 11,000, there are about 4,000 something. And these are rough numbers from my memory that come from the university system and from the privates. Then we have another chunk, about a third, who are lateral entry, and then the rest are out of state teachers. Well, where I'm going with this is, is how do we or do we uh, utilize or convey our new standards that we that are under constant revision to teacher prep programs and teacher certification uh, levels so that we're all on the same page we're teaching teachers to be teachers based on what they can anticipate when they get into the schools are so what's the integration process of all this we meet, in fact, looking around the room, some of the folks I meet with are here. We meet regularly with higher education. In fact, there is current uh, new legislation that came in the budget last year that originated in the Senate, where we look at teacher preparation programs. So we have new laws that come into effect in 2017-18. But we work really closely with the schools of education to make sure that future teachers understand the standard course of study they actually have access to most of them, the formative assessment technology tool that we use so that their students can practice those formative assessments while they're still in student teaching. We also require assessments or tests that teachers have to take uh, before they enter the classroom. If they don't pass them, they have two years to pass them, but then if they have not passed them at the end of two years, then they do not get their license, ever get a continuing license in this state. Uh, based on the General Assembly's uh, direction, we also have raised the standards for our teachers who teach in the elementary school in terms of what they have to know in reading and mathematics, because reading mathematics, the rigor in mathematics is so much more dramatic than it used to be. So we do have processes, uh, partnerships in place that we work with higher ed to try to make sure that teachers are ready. And then, to follow that up, our universities have an institution of higher education report card that comes out annually. So the schools of ed are actually graded on uh, the percentage of their students who do well on their teacher evaluation instrument. Their teacher student growth scores actually go back to the university where they came from the first three years. So the schools of ed know the effectiveness in terms of student outcome of their students. And so they're following those students and helping support them through the first three years. It truly is a partnership now to try to get teachers into the classroom to have the knowledge and skills that they need to be able to do the job. Thank you. May I add something? Uh, well, let me go to Representative Sam, then I'll come back to you, Linda, since you had a couple of, as we say in law, you had a couple of bites at the apple. <laughs> Potentially, this could be a two word answer. Math standards, um, when do they get my favorite subject in high school? Um, geometry. What year do they get geometry? They get geometry in their freshman, sophomore, and junior year. All three? It, yes. It is more of an integrated approach to uh, teaching mathematics than it used to be segmented. So they do get geometry spread across all three where it integrates with their algebraic functions. Representative Johnson, you're up again. Um, I just wanted to make a statement. Uh, uh, talking about um, teachers and, and how they're rated and they have a test. Um, our school systems uh, tend to know uh, the uh, Human Resources Department tends to know what schools will give you uh, the best teachers without a grade or without that. They know, even out of state, I think, they know those that they know which schools are performing and which aren't. Even though they have the uh, uh, out of state teachers uh, aren't coming are, are coming from somewhere else, they know. They do. We, they, 
Our school systems recruit in the areas that they have found to send them the best teachers. Um, and then UNC, Dr. Elisa Chapman at UNC, for the last several years has been responsible for conducting research to make sure that we understand how teachers coming from various portals, how they perform once they get into the classroom. And so using that research, we know how to support teachers when they come in because we know what they're likely, the teachers who are likely to need more help. Uh, I'm glad we've got a couple of other House members who are on the committee with us today. Representative Gill, would you like to ask her a question? No, I pretty much understand math. That was my major. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, let me ask a couple of things. Uh, and I'm sort of uh, thinking of uh, uh, Representative Jordan's comment about jargon. To be sure we're all on the same page, can you explain, just in case there are people here who don't know, what NAEP is? And uh, uh, I would like to ask you to maybe correct me if I mistake this. But I think on the most recent NAEP scores for fourth grade reading that we were like ninth in the nation. And I'm not sure where we were on the eighth grade test, but if you could sort of comment on that. And also, did NAEP also comment on what they considered to be the honesty of our standards in North Carolina, <coughs> measuring against where they think the standards ought to be. Can you help on those? I'll try. <laughs> I'm trying to remember exactly how we score. Uh, typically, in fourth grade reading, we score at or with the nation. I think we had inched up in the last time that we uh, got a reading, reading input. We typically score above the nation in fourth grade math. Last year, um, we were in the top five in the country in terms of honesty. And the way that they define honesty is how far from the NAEP, how, how far is your NAEP score from your state proficiency score? And we were very close. There were only a few states who were ahead of us. Um, this year, in fact, Dr. Atkinson has contacted the folks who did the honesty study. We were more in the middle of the country, we were honest or dishonest. When we looked back and found out what they had done, they had used our level three, which is our statewide proficiency score, but our career in college reg is level four. So if they had used our level four score, then we would have been up closer to the honesty um, band. And so we've asked them to review our report because our students are scoring um, pretty much aligned with them. And NAEP is the National Assessment of Educational Progress. It is an assessment test that is given in fourth and eighth grade, high school occasionally, but fourth and eighth grade, kind of in a, there, it's not an annual test. It is a test that occurs set every few years. And it's done by sampling. So <coughs> the students are drawn with a statistical sample and then they participate in the assessment and then we get the scores back but it's an it's a sample that is significant enough that you can draw generalizations from the data and every state is required to participate and it's been around now oh at least 20 years that i'm aware of so it, it is the gold standard in terms of your performance okay and uh, i want to ask you one other question that sort of goes back in largely, I think, to the topic that Representative Horn was discussing with you. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about North Carolina using North Carolina resources to develop our standards and our tests, and that the uh, math teachers in particular think the standards aren't where they need to be, can you give us a little bit of insight other than just an assurance as to how is it in this process of setting standards that we assure that the standards are being set where students need them to be for them to get the credentials and the success that they're going to need in later life and that we're not setting the standards to be comfortable for people where they are already teaching and to make ourselves 
get higher grades and feel better about the level of our current performance. We look at input from the organizations, for example, the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. We listen to the university system in terms of what is it that students need to know and be able to do to be successful at the next level. One of the ways that we feel like our standards over time have continued to help us meet the needs is we have a partnership with Metametrics. Metametrics is um, a, a company out of the triangle. And they use a reading scale and a math scale. Dr. Gary Williamson, who used to be um, with us, the accountability division, but Dr. Williamson, um, with his statistical background that he learned when he was at Stanford, was able to create a, a model to look at all of our scores over time and how growth in North Carolina has occurred. And so he has a wonderful chart that I wish I had with me if I'd known you were going to ask me this question. But he's well, able you to send it to us. I'll, send, I'll be happy to send it to you because it's great news. If you look at over time, when we started the ABCs back in the 90s and where we are now, growth in North Carolina has continued to occur. But what they have done recently, they have taken all of the data from hundreds of technical manuals from business and industry, textbooks from the university, and they have benchmarked where our Lexiles, or our reading scale scores, match to what you have to be able to do in college and careers. And our trajectory is dead on for where our students need to be based on our latest standards. Our standards before that fell a little short of being at the bullseye of where students need to be, but our new standards take us right exactly in the middle if our students master them of what students need to know and be able to do at the next level. So we have data based on literally millions of data points that were used to make these trajectories that show that if our students master the standards, and that's, you know, that's the piece. You can have great standards, but if the students can't do it, then it doesn't make any difference. So we've got to somehow be more successful in getting more of our students to master the standards. But what we ask students to do, if they can do it, we'll prepare them for the next step. And we have data now to show it.